Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Yellow Jackets Hive. I am Media Melanie here with. And I'm Emily. And we are beyond excited to do today's episode on Teen Travis and the Martinez family. And we are absolutely thrilled that we have Kevin Alves joining us, Teen Travis himself. Hey, Kevin. Hey, thank you guys so much for having me. Yes. Thank you for joining us. Yes, we appreciate it, and we're excited to chat a little bit about some season one, some season two, and maybe some behind-the-scenes stuff, whatever whatever comes up. I'm here for it. What have you been up to since filming has wrapped? Um, I quickly got to go see my family, which was amazing, um, and to kind of spend a little bit of time with everyone. So that's been really, really nice to get that that sense of being with your family again, and it's nice, you know our time here in Vancouver shooting is kind of all very cast related. We get to do a lot of cool things together, but then, you know, it's so many months away from, you know, seeing my parents and my sister and a lot of people. So it's been really nice to go back. And, uh, and now it's just getting prepped for the show coming out. It's been really, really fun, exciting though. It's cold here. So I'm excited to get down to like warmer weather to be able to go golf and like enjoy that kind of stuff now. Yeah. Absolutely. Nice. Um, would you say that you're fully decompressed yet from filming or? Yeah, I think what's great about the shoot schedule we have is that because we have the two timelines, we get a lot of in between time. So we flip from one timeline to the other. And so it allows us kind of some time to rest in between. So I haven't felt like too exhausted, more excited than anything, rather yeah. than exhausted. So yeah, if anything, I'm getting antsy waiting for the show to come out. <laughs> so are we. <laughs> you mentioned you're still up in Vancouver. One of our Twitter friends, Kristen McIsaac, wanted to know how did you like filming there? And what are some of your favorite spots to hang out while you're not filming? Ooh, okay. So we're kind of big escape room people. Uh, oh, so we love fine. going to escape rooms. Yeah. So a bunch of the cast, we've done that a few times. And also, we're also board game people. So we stay in a lot. I won't lie. We're definitely stay in type people. Um, but going out, like when it's nice out, I love going up to Whistler and, and, and enjoying that time. Like it's only a couple hours away. Um, but my favorite part about filming in Vancouver is I think how walkable the city is. Like you can kind of get anywhere, which is kind of awesome. Like I live when I'm here shooting the show, right kind of downtown in many aspects and our studio is kind of on the outskirts and I've had days where I just walked to the studio. I didn't even like drive or anything. I just took like an hour and a half walk and just took a nice oh, little wow. stroll to get there. So I think that's like one of my favorite parts about shooting here. And also how quickly you can get out of the city and be in the mountains and be in a different, completely different environment. I think that that's, you know, not a lot of cities have that ability to kind of in within an hour be in a completely different place. So that's yeah. quite nice about here. Yeah. So in general, what was it like filming season two in the actual wilderness? Um, it was cold. <laughs> 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 you know, it, it's winter this season. And so, you know, we've always, I, I loved season one, always the idea of at the end, always say winter's coming, winter's coming. We really pushed that. And it, it was here. We had, we had it. And it was, it was a lot of fun though, uh, getting to go. I'm sure you've seen in some of the, teasers there's a couple of shots that are really big drone shots of mountains and uh that was actually i got to go out there and, and shoot on the mountains a bit which was super cool and uh and that was it was freezing but probably my favorite couple of days shooting was being out there in four foot deep snow trekking through it yeah it was wow it was it was taxing and i can't wait for everyone to see those shots because seeing them was it was breathtaking like it, unreal breathtaking Right. And, you know, speaking of cold, you were actually a competitive ice skater. Would you say that competing in ice skating was more difficult or filming yellow jackets in the cold? I know it's a little different, but. Yeah, difficulties in different ways. Um, I think filming in the cold, you're not prepped for it. And so you kind of, you're kind of just trying, you're, you're holding on to hand warmers and, and we get to some really, really low degrees. Whereas skating, if I'm going to be honest, we got to a point that a lot of the rinks we competed in were pretty nice in terms of temperature, even though we were skating right. on ice. It was, you know, with all the lights and stuff and camera shooting when you're when you're indoors in a in a place, it was it was quite nice out. So in terms of difficulty of falling on my rear 
20 times, 30 times, 40 times a day. I'll give it to I'll give it to skating, but the cold definitely shooting. Okay. We'd kind of like to know what would you say your favorite scene was from the the um the premiere from season two, episode one, or maybe which was the craziest to film? Did you did you have a big presence in the um first episode of season two? Yes, yeah, so the first episode there was a scene that was really difficult for me to film and I, I can't wait for uh, people to see it. It was just a, it was, it was a different side to Travis, which was quite nice to uh, kind of go into that world and have people understand kind of what Travis is going through a little bit. Yeah. Um, but my favorite scene of the whole episode doesn't include me at all. Yeah. And it's, uh, it in, yeah, uh, Warren has a scene that definitely is my favorite scene and, once you watch it, I think once anyone sees it, they're going to know exactly which scene I'm talking about. It's pretty spectacular. Oh, I can't wait. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Yeah. We are so excited. One thing we did see from the trailer was this uh, scene of you mm -hmm. and Lottie. And, you know, it looks like she's maybe performing some kind of like ritual or something. Is there any context you can give to that scene at all? Or um, The only context I can give you when it comes to that specific shot is – we're definitely going to be exploring a lot of complexity in the situation that these um, teens are going through, the complexity of uh, power struggles in some ways and, and, yeah. and kind of who, who takes the lead on things. And more importantly, with Travis, we're going to be dealing with the complexity of kind of feeling lost. There's, there's definitely going to be, there, you know, at, at some point, you know, being one of the, one of the few men there, it was gonna it was gonna be taxing on him and i think we start to see a lot of him trying to find some sort of purpose and meaning and get confused by a lot of things and so that's yeah. it's it's definitely it's definitely gets complex with between all all the girls and and travis and and the situation that they're in you and sophie focused um had a lot of scenes together would you say yeah. there's more with the other characters in general in season 2 I think the story takes us in a place that is um, it's hard to even be able to explain to you how our interactions become because it definitely um, the, we get into like the idea of actually being in the wilderness, not, you know, I think the facade of community starts to disappear this season, the facade of, of work of hope. And so the interactions that we have, Definitely, of course, we stick to a lot of that group interaction that we had in season one as well, where people are trying to, you know, communicate and figure things out. But definitely um, on top of speaking with uh, uh, having scenes with Sophie, there's definitely some some other scenes that t that take place in some other communication, similarly to season one, where there was a bit of back and forth um, between a few characters. But I'm yeah, I think the facade of community disappearing is what leads us to this show getting really into the grittiness of, of being out there for that long. Yeah, absolutely. So Showtime describes your character as sometimes obnoxious. Do you feel that way? And what is it like to play sometimes like an unlikable character? Yeah, I, I think, you know, I'm kind of happy when I see you know, comments online that people are really unhappy with Travis and his actions and everything, because <laughs> that is sort of the point, right? He is a 17 year old kid in 1996 trapped with a bunch of people he doesn't know or doesn't feel comfortable around. And so I expected nothing but for him to make bad choices. And so I kind of was, was prepared for that going in. I had a great uh, talk with the showrunners when I took on the role and we kind of knew that he was going to be confused and and acting out a lot and i think um you know i'm okay with being described as obnoxious because at times he absolutely is because i think it's his defense mechanism you know at the end of the day he doesn't speak and he and there's only a few scenes that you seem really open up to natalie and so he doesn't speak that much um and so yeah so I, i'm okay with him being obnoxious when it comes to conflict okay do you think your character is evolving into more or less likable out there? As you mentioned, you know, communities degrading and all of that stuff. Um, by the end of season two, your character journey, more or less likable? 
I would say that we're just peeling off more layers of what makes mm. him maybe unlikable okay. and what makes him, you know, tr- you know, what is his truth and what is he going through? I think we're just peeling off some layers this season. Okay. So what do you think is the worst thing that Teen Travis has done? Yes, Kenzie is cozy is asking from our Twitter feed. The worst thing Travis has done. Um, one that pops into my mind, because I don't want to classify them in terms of what I think is better or worse, but one that pops into my mind right away is pulling the gun on Natalie. Oh, I think yes. that's at the end of the day in episode four, um, that shows his explosive, the ability for him to be explosive in a very toxic way. Mm-hmm. And I think, yeah, that one, that one just always pops out to me because I even remember shooting the scene and being like, and feeling that like a rattled up that Travis was getting and, and you're like, man, like you can't do this. Like you, you, you know, you're in your own head, you have your own conscience. You're like, you can't do this, but you know, you're, you're, you're definitely trying to identify why he's going through that stuff. And you can see how he just has the ability to be really explosive. I also think that, you know, using her past against her when it comes to Bobby Farley and the situation that he was in, like, that's really tough to put him in. But at the same time, you have to empathize with the fact that, you know, he was feeling his distrust and that brought him to his own toxic place because she didn't talk to him about Bobby Farley when he brought it up to her. And so there was just, there's a lot of, there's a lot of layers to their toxic relationship. And yet, Mm -hmm. Um, at the end of the day, there's just things he does that, you know, you hope that your partner would never um, put you through. Yeah. So back to the season one pilot, there was some tension with the Martinez family before you guys were taking off to fly to nationals. Do we get more context of your family background in season two? Um, It was funny because when we shot that scene, from the pilot, uh, Jamie Travis, who was directing that piece for me because uh, Karen wasn't uh, available to do the reshoots at the time. So Jamie Travis helped us do that scene and he came to me and he was like, okay, so we have 13 seconds to do a lot of storytelling. <laughs> he was like, that's how much screen time we have. We have to do a lot of storytelling. And so kind of the mission with that scene was to make sure that you understood that he didn't want to go that mm-hmm. he doesn't believe in what his parents are putting up a facade for hobby of and and the dynamic between him and his brother and how they're not nearly as close as you would hope yeah and so those three things i think i think come through in that scene and um i think it really helped propel kind of travis and hobby forward in terms of their back and forth when it came to their different feelings about their dad because you can tell that throughout that time period there's different feelings about their dad in this new season i think we're grappling a lot more with travis's feelings about himself versus his family and i think that's that's where we're headed now is it's more about how he's dealing with himself and the people around him because he was very he never spoke to everyone around him very much and this is more about him trying to uh kind of control his own feelings his own impulses and so um yeah we definitely do get to see more into what what drove him forward and you know in 20 years in the future and that kind of stuff and we definitely get to see more of uh more of travis and and his story um but not in particular to that scene in the pilot okay got it and and you were actually upgraded to a series regular as well for season two so congratulations that's very exciting Thank you so much. I, I'm just so grateful to be on the show. The The writing is brilliant. The cinematography this season is going to blow everyone away. Um, yeah, just really excited. Uh, we can't wait. We are, we are getting glimpses into kind of future traps as we did last season and kind of, you know, what happened in the future. So the in-between is still unknown as to how we got from one place to another. Okay. And I think that's because it's ever evolving with the story and mm-hmm. uh, and and how the story is going. And so I have always told the writers and producers that I only really need to know what's happened that's going to inform the future. I never really need to know what's coming. I just want to know if there's anything that I've done or that has happened to me that's going to inform what I'm doing now. That's important. Um, but where it's going, I think will tell its own story. 
you know, we mentioned Javi before. Um, in real life, would you say that you and uh, Luciano have like a brotherly relationship? Does he look up to you? What's what's that relationship like? <sighs> Luciano, first of all, is incredibly talented and such an amazing uh, kid to work. With. Oh, my God. I look at that picture and <laughs> he has grown so much. And so it's really it's, it's crazy. I was I was with him and his family literally a week ago for dinner and uh, they're fantastic. And yeah, Luciano and I have always had a very um, brotherly relationship from the get go. We uh, will hang out and spend time together when we go down for uh, the premiere. We're going to Disney together. So oh, it's, it's definitely. Yeah, I've seen some of his other work. Like I'm so excited to see all the stuff that he does because yeah, he's going to blow people's minds. What was it like filming the scene where Travis forces Javi to spit the gum out that his dad gave him? Hard. I think it's one main word. Yeah. Difficult. I think that's probably the most difficult thing in terms of playing Travis is um, kind of having to accept and justify his behavior with his brother. Yeah. And, and that's really tough. And, you have to remember his age to remember how he, why he's acting the way he is with his brother. But shooting those scenes is always tough because any scene with Luciano where there's some sort of negative impact, it's it's really tough because I, I love the kid so much. And so when you are physically, you know, putting him in harm's way in some capacity, it's 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 really hard. But also when we finish those scenes, we both feel very like we're just proud that we're telling we're making sure we're telling the whole story that we're not sugarcoating it, that we, we go there. Like, and that's like, I remember filming the part where like once the gum spits out and I, I throw it and I scream at him, it's, I remember over and over again, turning around when it was his coverage after throwing the gum and screaming and literally wanting to cry because he's just like, he's there, like the most innocent face, the nicest person. And he's like in tears and you're like, I can't do this scene. <laughs> but, you know, I think, I think mostly we're just proud that we get through it when we yeah. film those scenes. And when, when you went back to get the ring off of your dad's hand, um, I feel like that really showed, you know, Travis's emotional depth. Um, in general, the scenes like that with Sophie, like what what she like as a scene partner? Yeah, episode four of season one was um, a really beautiful episode to shoot with Sophie. We had Deepa Mehta as our director and Deepa took them, the emotional relationship between them really seriously in terms of preparation and in terms of blocking. And we never rushed shooting a scene in episode four, which always felt really nice. Like Deepa gave us all the time in the world to figure it out. And um, and that really helped kind of make it so that we didn't have to prepare for future episodes because we had built such a strong base during that episode. And Sophie is incredibly talented and hardworking. And, and so it was really easy to do all those scenes with Sophie just because so professional and, and easy to work with. And so we always just kind of understood where these two characters were. And, and from there, we just always came in really prepared and, and it never felt, it never felt hard to make those scenes work because we both understood the characters and that was, and that, and everyone was just trying to be as truthful as we could to the story. Um, Yeah, it was, it was really, really easy to work with after episode four because we really took our time and kind of made sure that there was a strong base. Deepa Mehta came up to us so many times and said, this is the beginning of this. So we're going to make sure that it's set. And it was really, really, I'm really thankful for Deepa and that. Oh, fantastic. Now, our Twitter friend Kaylee wanted to know, how was it to be a male character in a female-dominated series where the isolation increasingly gave them confidence in their power? What was it like being the only dude? (laughs) <laughs> I think, yeah, it was really kind of fun to shoot the escalation of it in season one. And I think we definitely continue on in season two in, in the direction of the escalation of power struggles. And um, it definitely made it so that I had to really always understand that Travis very often wasn't going to speak up. And I kind of had to accept that from the beginning. Travis's character very often isn't going to speak up, which also made me start to understand the importance of when travis does speak yeah because if he does and he chooses to even if it's masked in something negative or 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 grungy or rude majority of the time it's because it's important to him and to the story and to what's going on and that he feels strongly about something so you know i think first of all working with such talented 
people on this show made it so easy to kind of just I like sitting back and just watching everyone do their thing and and be so incredible at their jobs. Um, so it just made me appreciate like Travis as a character and, and when he does speak and 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 definitely the season you see more of that kind of dynamic of like who's going to say what when. And, and, and I think, I think even between all the female characters as well, like the idea of this power dynamic makes you go like, okay, every single word that anyone says, there's, there's meaning behind it. There's, there's, there's something important. People don't speak for no reason because it's very easy not to speak when you're in a group that big. Yeah. Right. And so it definitely, um, we definitely see people step up at the right moments at different places during the season. So it's going to be really cool to kind of see all that unravel and watch kind of fans see people go oh yeah oh no like a back and forth depending on who it is that they're really rooting to lead which season two episode i know you know we haven't seen them yet but which episode would you say is the most impactful in general or your favorite episode from season two um if i'm just gonna speak personally in terms of just when i read them because i haven't seen them all yet and so from reading and the experience of shooting them episode two and episode 10 the finale are um pretty unreal and uh yeah. and i never got to work with karen because i wasn't there for the pilot my character was created after the pilot was done and so to work on episode 10 with karen was an amazing experience and episode two i got to work with ben seminoff for the first time and ben is so detailed and he cares so much about what's in the frame and and i appreciate that in directors so much because it allows me to understand a lot more like what we're trying to shoot versus just what i'm trying to feel and and that helps like i think because we have such a huge cast and you want to make sure that that screen time is used correctly for that story to be told clearly um it's nice to know a director's vision and both those directors were so clear that it it made it a lot of fun for me and and i think that you know, episode two is a massive, um, just beautiful piece of TV. Yeah. We've heard that um, episode two, things get pretty crazy. <laughs> yes. Oh, can't wait. Listen, this whole season, things get pretty crazy. <laughs> <laughs> you're into music, right? And I know, Emily, your friend Leah had a question she wanted to know. Yes. She wanted to know what music Travis was listening to when they were about to take off for the flight to go to nationals. Yeah. So this is kind of a hilarious story. So I'm so into music, but I had no idea that I was going to have anything of a prop until about three seconds to when we shot it three <laughs> seconds before, like that was like a prop that we just added in. So I really had nothing. I had nothing in my mind and I was like, no. And I mind blanked while we're shooting. Cause I'm like, <laughs> I'm like, I can't even think of a song from that period right now. I'm like, <laughs> and so, and so I honest, I honestly just internalized a beat that I made up in my head at that moment. I was like, okay, I got to do something. I have no time to think about this. And so that that's all that happened in that moment. It's kind of crazy, but I will say that for me personally, like whenever we're shooting something that's really heavy because it's about community, a song that I listen to a lot is I See Fire by Ed Sheeran. Oh, it's a I love song Ed Sheeran. That I play that song a lot because it's about community and everyone around you and watching everything just change. And so that song, I, I very often you'll hear it just playing in my headphones whenever we're getting to like stuff that's really intense and heavy, both season one, season two. It's like your walk-up song a little bit, right? A little bit. Mm filming for season one or season two were there any pranksters on set did anybody play jokes on each other like any funny stories to tell from filming season two um the thing is is we shoot pretty quick so it's a little harder like as much as we'd love to to prank around we shoot really quick and we have a lot to get done like right. those cat cabin scenes like all that stuff was really like you know, it, it, you have to get, you have so many people in the room and we have to move those sets really quick. And um, so we don't get to prank too much, but what we do have, we have a couple of ongoing things where number one is like, we really try and get people to like catch their attention without the other person knowing right out of nowhere and like tap the shoulder and walk away and, <laughs> and really just watch people. Um, we do a lot of kind of like, we'll videotape somebody and zoom in on them, like making the worst faces. And then we'll take random pictures and send them in the group chat and like zoom in on someone's face and then <laughs> make memes of each other. Um, That's cute. And then the last one is we try and repeat, we try and get someone to repeat what they say. Like they'll say something and you'd be like, oh yeah, uh, Kevin, 
and they'll be like, yeah. And then you'll say right back to them what they said and like completely make them, we just catch people off guard a lot on set. Um, but it is just a very like professional cast. I think what's nice about the crew on this show is that um, everyone takes a lot of pride in their work. So there's a lot of detail going into everything before every shot. So we try as best we can, knowing that we all like to joke around. So we try and stay in the moment as best we can. Mm. So would you say that your most proud moment so far is on the ice or on screen? Hmm. I think when I think of my life now on screen and the work that I'm doing um, to really, there's such a reach that the show is starting to have. And, and yeah. that's really nice to make sure that people feel seen and heard in their stories and, and be able to relate to characters that, are unlikable are likable and and go like it's okay that you're unlikable in some moments and that you're likable in others and i think that's that makes me really proud of um playing travis especially um but with skating it was more of like accomplishing things you told yourself you wanted to do from when you were really young that always makes me really proud um and you know getting to perform in front of four or five six thousand people at once like that's yeah. those feelings like are, they're just something that live with you forever um mm -hmm. yeah so it's so hard to compare the two but as of right now because of what i'm thinking about in my life um i think uh playing travis takes the takes the win do you have any personal yeah. goals for 2023 um yeah personally um with a bunch of great people that I'm getting to start to work with. Um, I've started uh, directing some short films. And so, oh, cool. we're, yeah, so we shot one last year um, that we're in post-production right now and we're in pre-production for another one that we're going to shoot in a couple months. And so it'll just be really nice to have both of those done and out there in the world and just kind of start to build that, that side of um, my career because I, I really, really love uh, storytelling in general. And so I'm, yeah. uh, it's been a really beautiful process to go from the beginning, right from when the writers are are putting it all together to the end of finishing the last credit sequence, the last extra sound piece that you need to put in. So being a part of that um, has been really beautiful and I'm excited to see them come to fruition and have them be out there for people to watch. One more question, three <laughs> words, three words to describe season two. Hmm. Power, Okay. gotta throw that okay. one in there. Um, Starvation. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and um, in a sense, because of the cold, I'll use the word captivity. Okay. Because there's a sense of there's a sense of no getting out, no right. getting away from this now. Yeah. And so that's uh, those are the three big, big things that I could say. Okay. Excellent. Well, we cannot wait. <laughs> yes, we're very excited. No, I'm I'm really excited for everyone to see it. And um, thank you so much for having me. It was a blast. And uh, and yeah, I can't I can't wait to see what everyone thinks. <laughs> so Emily, that was amazing chatting with Kevin. Um, yes. What do you What do you think was your favorite story that he told us? Um, it's really awesome to know that the cast is like just as close off screen as they are on screen so knowing that like he has that relationship with luciano it's like very endearing and it just makes the bonds that they have on screen like more believable knowing that they like have this bond in real life too absolutely we talked with kevin a little bit about the martinez family and you had a theory that you had posted on reddit about um, Travis and the seance. Why don't you tell us a little bit about the theory and then we can chat on that. Okay. Because of all the symbolism and ritualism of the seance, I definitely think there are things that they did during the seance that they will continue to implement in rituals in the future as well. Jackie's dialogue when they initially begin the seance, O oh, keeper of this wild and hidden place, we anoint ourselves with blood and earth, along with the X's the girls place on their foreheads that were made out of dirt and deer blood, could definitely be something I know 
could definitely be something I see them incorporating into future rituals. I noticed a few similarities between the seance and the scene where Travis's body was discovered. During the seance, Jackie suggests they place candles along the symbols carved into the attic floor. And Misty pointed out in photos from Travis's crime scene, there were candles placed underneath his body in the shape of the symbol that were burned and then taken away. Shauna ties a knife to a string and creates a pendulum for the spirit to communicate through. At the scene of Travis's death, it looked like his body was supposed to be the pendulum in that setup. Did anyone happen to notice any other similarities between the two scenes? Was there anything that happens in the seance that particularly stuck out to you that you think we could see more of in the future? I feel like coming up with that theory about, you know, um, like adult Travis being the metaphorical knife and pendulum, that's that's really interesting. And I think it, yeah. it ties the two timelines together. Um, and then, you know, as we just talked about with Kevin, we see him and Lottie performing this, this ritual situation yeah. as well. So um, I'm really interested to see where season two goes in terms of, you know, developing that, tying the two Travis stories together and um, also just getting more context, like Kevin was saying into, you know, uh, past Travis, like giving more context to his character and his family, you know, before they crash and then also future Travis. So yeah, um, I'm, I'm very excited about both of those things. Yeah. I think that, like you said, like that would definitely tie the two timelines together, like the teen and the adult timeline. And like we've said so many times, I feel like a lot of the things that they do are very deliberate when it comes to like the seance and like the things that we see them doing as a group. And I just really feel like those are going to carry over into the future. Absolutely. Um, You had a favorite teen Travis quote. What quote is that? I love the part in Doom Coming when Jackie calls him over and they start dancing and she talks about how he's with a bunch of babes and he says, do you ever feel like your humility holds you back? <laughs> that, that was definitely, <laughs> definitely a good one. That was my um, favorite line for sure. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, we talked a little bit about like maybe Travis feeling a sense of responsibility for, um, for Jackie's death. You know, they had just yes. slept together. Um, you know, if they had not slept together, you know, maybe things would have been different, but, uh, maybe that blowout between Shauna and Jackie never would have happened. I do wonder if his character feels like some sort of, you know, responsibility for that. What do you think? I, I mean, if it were me and I was Travis in that situation, I would definitely feel some kind of guilt just because like if him and Jackie never slept together, then there's a chance that Shauna and Jackie may have never gotten into that huge argument that led Jackie to sleep outside. So, I mean, I feel like they were bound to have some kind of a fight at some point, but the end result may have not been the same. I don't think that, if that fight never happened, then she would have never slept outside. Bottom line. Paisa said to adult Nat, um, you know, they were toxic and terrible for each other. Yeah. And um, I mean, you know, another thing I, I want to know is what happened in between the rescue and now between Travis and Nat. Right. I yeah. mean, yeah. A, I mean, I'm question. so, I'm so curious about that just because like, when Natalie goes to Travis's house, she sees that picture of them on his dresser. And the picture of them looks like it's pretty recent, like within the last couple years anyways, because they look the same as they look in the show. So something had to have happened within the last couple years that made Travis go off the grid the way that he did and disappear from everything and everyone that he knew, including Natalie, who he obviously had a very close bond with. Like we see that developing in the teen timeline and we know that it carried over just based off of things that the ca the characters have said in the show. Absolutely. Now at one point, adult Nat says to Misty, um, you know, once Misty realized the symbol was made with those pictures at Travis's death scene, uh, Travis didn't believe in any of this shit. Yeah. Um, but yet we see in the teaser trailer, the scene of, you know, Travis and Lottie. So it seems like, you know, something triggered him to go off the grid. 
And maybe he bought in. Maybe something happened in his life where he sought Lottie for help. I mean, how tied in are, are they going to be? Based on that picture that we saw, you know, in the teaser trailer, I mean, that's and something. That also makes me think about um, in the – that also makes me think about when um, – when we see him doing like when we see Lottie laying him back in that quick little peek that we get in the teaser, it makes me think of the deleted scene or not the deleted scene, the, the, the audition videos. auditions that, yeah, that yes. came out a couple months ago and Lottie is talking to her therapist in one of the auditions. And she says something like Travis came to, find me and wanted me to like do what I did back in the woods for him. Mm -hmm. So that immediately made me go to that picture. Like that picture made me think about that audition immediately because I feel like it has to hold some truth to it. Like the audition that we saw. On, Absolutely. On yes. And you know, they've since deleted them. So that yes. makes me think that they are actually authentic and we may actually see those scenes in season two, which yeah. we cannot wait for. And yeah. again, for, for everyone watching and listening, you're watching and listening to this after the premiere of season two has already aired. So, you know, by now we have a little bit more context. So feel free to drop some questions, some comments, you know, on our socials. And, um, you know, I think we could probably dive a little deeper now that we've all seen the pilot. Um so, yes, I just can't wait for March 24th. I mean, I know. oh, my goodness. I feel like the cast is probably just exci as excited as we are to see it. Like, because as Kevin said, like, they worked so hard and they worked for, like, six months, like, half the year. Like, that's a lot of time and energy to devote to something. And they're obviously very proud of what they did. And they should be. I mean, Everything about the show is phenomenal. Like the actors, the directors, the people behind the scenes, the people in front of the camera, like it's all, it's all amazing. So. And there's not a lot of these like puzzle box shows like this no. where there's so much we don't know. Yellow Jackets just does such a great job of creating those mysteries. And for that reason, I feel like it's got to be one of the most highly anticipated premieres of 2023 there are just not a lot of other shows that that can do this yeah. and for people who haven't watched yellow jackets yet and who now kind of like get on the train or the plane i should say <laughs> um I, they're in for a delightfully wild ride i you know um i i think it's going to explode if yeah I, I mean once season two's here it makes me feel a little bit bad that like Travis gets as much hate as he gets like in the fandom too. Like, like Kevin said, like the whole, like you're supposed to find him unlikable. Like that's the point. But I personally feel like he's a really great example of what teenage boys were like in that time period. Like, I don't think that he is more douchey than <laughs> another <laughs> random guy that you would just find on the street like and like kevin said like he was thrown into this unfamiliar environment where he's surrounded by women and he's the only guy so like how i don't think anybody would know how to act in that situation absolutely and i mean i never personally found him super unlikable i enjoyed his character because i thought it was integral especially to nat's storyline yep. but it, it really is a testament to how great an actor kevin is to yeah. play that part and you could just hear him with such a level of of passion speaking about the filming and i just love that i feel like you know all actors are maybe not as as dedicated, but it sounds like the entire Yellow Jack yeah. universe, like you said, you know, in front of and behind the cameras are all just these amazing professionals who are so dedicated to this. And, you know, they each have their own character journey and they've just done such a, a great job telling all of these stories. Yeah. And like Natalie's storyline would be so different if Travis wasn't in the picture. Like, I can't even imagine what it would be like without Travis because I felt like he's obviously a very integral part in who Natalie becomes as a person. 
And I think a lot of people in the fandom, like, don't like to see a woman, like, depending on a guy for something. But she's not depending on him at the same time. Like, she takes care of herself. Like, I feel like they are very much, like, equals with each other. Like, in the authority or power that each one of them has. Like, they both hunt. They're both good at it. Like, they provide food for the group. Like, so I feel like they're on, like, an evil, even level. Right. If that makes sense. Absolutely. Um, any other Martinez family or Travis topics that you'd like to cover before we go? Mm, I mean, we touched on it already a little bit, but, like, I'm just so curious to know what happens post-wilderness, like, before he dies because like there have been so many indicators that like something really messy happened like when tight Ty- when Natalie calls Thaisa in jail to get her to bail her out like she says something like you two are you two are toxic for each other like I mean I feel like we've seen a little bit of that in the wilderness but at the same time like if you take the wilderness out of the equation I feel like their relationship was a pretty normal like high school relationship right absolutely I definitely want to know what led Travis to where he ends up in the adult timeline that's one of the things I'm actually like most curious about about the show right right and I mean we know you know you know season one ended with Lottie Matthews emptied Travis's bank account and I know you actually have a couple of theories on that right right what is what is your theory on that Emily oh I wish I would have brought this up when he was still with us (laughs) um so I am a big believer that uh the key to getting Travis's bank into Travis's bank account is that hobby has to somehow be involved it's We've talked about this at length before, and I've done a lot of research on what it takes to close out a bank account after someone dies, and it's not easy. So I feel like the most logical culprit for it being emptied would be Javi has to somehow be tied to it. And another reason why I think that is because we know that Javi is not Adam, but the creators did say that they toyed with that idea before they went against it. So in my mind, I'm thinking if they're thinking hobby is Adam, then that means they have plans for hobby as an adult. So that makes me think, yeah, that makes me think even more that hobby might somehow be behind it. And I know that there's, we've talked about this too. Like there's speculation that maybe like Lottie and Travis got married or something. And that's why she would uh, have the rights to empty his bank account. Right. That makes sense being a spouse. Yep. I've also heard that Lottie married Javi, which I think it would be more believable for her to marry Travis than Javi. But yes, 100%. 100%. Um, And then, you know, one more thing. Um, There was the note that Travis left that said, tell Nat she was right. Um, We don't know yet what that means. What what do you think it means? Do you think that Nat had you know, said something about Lottie and then, you know, Travis and her got together and that's what she was right about. Um, I feel like there could be a couple possibilities. Like I, we're assuming that the she in the note means Natalie, but that she could be someone else. So it could be tell that she was right as in another person was right about something, but that doesn't make as much sense to me. I think it's probably like tell Natalie she was right about something, but yeah, I've thought maybe it could be that they all thought that Lottie wasn't around anymore. And somehow he found out that she's still in the picture and maybe Natalie suspected that. So he was saying, tell Natalie that she's right, that Lottie's still here. Or she's back because we know yeah. that she was in Switzerland and and we've heard that the adult survivors thought that she was still, you know, getting these treatments, the shock treatments that we saw in the teaser trailer, you know, in Switzerland. So it could have something to do with like, yeah. oh, shit, Lottie's back, you know, yeah. tell Nat she was right. So that's that's definitely a possibility as well. 
That's a long time to believe that somebody is in an institution. 25 years, right? And like no one's writing letters or visiting that we've known. I mean, someone's sending postcards somewhere, but, you know, we don't know yet, of course, who they're coming from. So another TBD moment in Yellow Jackets. Yeah, for sure. Yes. How great was it having Kevin join us? I mean, he was great. He was really easy to talk to. He gave us a lot of information. It was great. Again, you're watching this after the season two uh, premiere has already aired. So, um, you know, hopefully we'll have learned a little bit more about Travis in that first episode. So I can't wait. (laughs) Yeah, same here. Well, hey, thank you all for joining us. We appreciate it. Yes. Until we spill again.